At 3 p.m. on January 1, 1995, sensors on the Dropner natural gas platform in the Norwegian North Sea logged what is considered the first officially recorded rogue wave in history. The Dropner wave, also referred to as the New Year's wave, had a maximum recorded height of 25.6 meters, or 84 feet, more than twice as high as the next highest recorded waves in the area at the time. Before the Dropner wave was recorded, a statistical model called the Gaussian function was used to predict maximum potential wave height. The model showed that waves would almost never exceed 15 meters or 49 feet, and a wave of 30 meters or 98 feet was only possible once every 10,000 years. And while throughout history, mariners told stories of giant freak waves that would tower over ships and swallow them in an instant, reputable eyewitness accounts were rare. Oceanography texts barely mentioned freak or rogue waves, and when they did, they were written off as virtually impossible. You've probably seen this image before. It represents research done by the statistician Abraham Wald on aircraft that returned from combat missions during World War II, probably the most well-known example of survivorship bias research ever conducted. The areas showing the most hits are where a plane can take damage and survive. The parts of the plane with no damage represent the areas where a hit will prove fatal. In her 2010 book, The Wave, author Susan Casey wrote that eyewitness accounts of the rogue wave phenomenon really only began to appear after the advent of stronger steel double-hulled ships in the 20th century, because before that, people who encountered these events usually didn't survive. Following the Dropner wave in 1995, Subsequent research began to substantiate the phenomenon, and the first comprehensive scientific study on rogue waves was published in 1997. Since then, while they remain unpredictable, and their exact causes are a topic of heavy debate, rogue waves are now a well-documented phenomenon that, while still rare, occur far more frequently than once thought. They are defined as a wave whose height is more than twice that of the next highest waves in the area at the time. These massive walls of water can form without warning and can be extremely dangerous even for the best equipped modern vessels. While we only began to understand rogue waves in the later 1990s, there are a number of well-documented cases of ocean liners encountering these massive waves with devastating results. On January 10, 1910, the RMS Lusitania was struck by a 23 meter or 75 foot wave that did significant damage to her bridge. And in December 1942, the Queen Mary, while operating as a troop ship, encountered a 28 meter or 92 foot wave some 608 nautical miles off the coast of Scotland. The 80,000 ton liner was carrying 11,339 American soldiers and crew at the time and nearly capsized, listing an astonishing 52 degrees before slowly riding herself. This event would inspire the 1969 novel, The Poseidon Adventure, and the 1972 film by the same name. In 1966, one of these freak waves proved deadly for the Italian liner SS Michelangelo. The Michelangelo was built for the Italian line by the Ansaldo shipyard in Genoa. Designated yard number 1577, initial plans for the Michelangelo and her sister the Raffaello began taking shape in 1958. While jet travel was already gaining a foothold at the time, a pair of superliners seemed an appropriate fit for the Mediterranean routes. They were the largest liners built in Italy since the SS Rex launched in 1931. The Michelangelo came in at 45,911 tons. She was 276.2 meters or 609 feet 2 inches long with a beam of 30.1 meters or 98 feet and 9 inches. She was equipped with geared turbines that produced 87,000 shaft horsepower, driving twin propellers, achieving a respectable service speed of 26.5 knots, and she could accommodate 1,775 passengers across three classes with a crew of 720. The Michelangelo was launched on September 16, 1962. Along with her twin sister, they were two of the last purpose-built ocean liners to ever enter service. She featured a sleek white hull design and featured two, dare I say, weird-ass funnels, 
They featured a trellis-like pipework design that allowed wind to pass through them, with a large smoke-deflecting fin on top. The design was polarizing, even though their grape improved effective at deflecting smoke from her afterdecks. She finally sailed her maiden voyage on May 12, 1965. By the time she entered service, jet travel was clearly eating into passenger numbers on the transatlantic routes, and the Michelangelo and her sister quickly struggled to attract passengers. But at least in her early years, she was considered a glamorous option for travelers on the Atlantic, and she saw a brief window of notoriety. It was really getting rough and windy now. On April 6, 1966, the Michelangelo departed Genoa for a regularly scheduled voyage to New York City. She was commanded by senior captain Giuseppe Saletti, a man with over 40 years of experience on the sea. He was nearing the end of his career, and this was to be one of his final crossings. On this voyage, she carried 1,495 passengers, including German novelist Gunther Grass and his wife Anna, the president of the Italian line, and Bob Montana, the artist who first created the Archie comics. Crossings this early in the season often faced difficult weather conditions, and the winter of 1966 was proving especially challenging. Michelangelo's more southerly route allowed her to mostly avoid the rough seas of the North Atlantic, but six days into the voyage on April 12th, as she continued west, she was forced to traverse the difficult weather as she shifted her heading north to reach New York. Conditions rapidly deteriorated. Soon, heavy seas and hurricane-force winds thrashed at the Great Liner. The ship was being thrown around so violently that Captain Saletti ordered all passengers remain in their cabins and he directed a change in course to keep the sea on the starboard bow and not directly at four. The Michelangelo featured first-class accommodations in her forward superstructure, with windows that offered spectacular views of her prow. In a precaution against the heavy waves that battered her bow and forward superstructure, Captain Saletti ordered passengers in those accommodations move to safer interior staterooms. Further precautions were taken to protect against the storm. Front and side windows and portholes were armored, watertight doors were closed, and safety ropes were put up throughout her public rooms to help passengers keep their balance as they moved through the large open spaces. Warnings were also issued over the ship's public address system, advising passengers to stay in their cabins and avoid any unnecessary movement. As she sailed through the storm, she picked up an SOS from a nearby tanker called the Rocos that sustained damage and was taking on water. Reacting quickly, Captain Saletti ordered the Michelangelo sail to the stricken vessel to aid in the rescue, but soon after adjusting their heading, the Rocos radioed again, reporting that the situation was now under control and they would no longer need assistance. Michelangelo was free to adjust her heading back to New York. But soon after they resumed their course, an air intake on her foredeck was broken open, allowing water to pour into the ship. Captain Saletti inverted the liner's route, turning her prow in the opposite direction of the waves to provide cover from the violent sea for Vice Captain Claudio Kuslich and four other volunteer crew members while they headed forward to repair the damage. As the men struggled to complete the difficult task, the storm around them began to lull. While the heavy seas calmed, the sky above swirled through an ominous array of dark, inky grays. With conditions improving, Captain Saletti felt it was now safe enough to allow passengers and crew back into the forward sections of the ship. Ferner Berndt, a businessman from Hamburg and his wife, returned to their forward cabin to change their clothes. John Steinbach, a 58-year-old Chicago insurance executive and his assistant, returned to their cabin next door and several off-duty crew members also raced back to the forward cabins to watch and photograph what was left of the storm. At around 10 a.m., the crew led by Vice Captain Kuslich had finished repairing the storm damage and called up to the bridge to let Captain Sledi know it was safe to resume their original course. Just as she was completing the maneuver, the Michelangelo unexpectedly dropped into an unusually deep trough, almost immediately followed by a massive wall of water that slammed into the liner's prow and forward superstructure, plunging the ship into momentary chaos. <laughs> For
first officer, Claudio Sitoro, was in the chart room at the time, having only just moved away from the bridge's central windows only a few minutes before, a spot where he almost certainly would have been killed. Sutora didn't remember the moment the wave hit, only what happened immediately after. He was plunged into momentary darkness, followed by a rush of water that filled the bridge and swept him off his feet. As he regained his footing, he followed the overwhelming sounds of alarm bells and buzzers emanating from the wheelhouse. There, he found the room flooded, with sea rushing out. Nearly every window was smashed open. On the starboard side, he found Captain Saletti, still stunned, bracing for a potential second impact. The other men on the bridge, having all miraculously survived the explosion of water, were in similar stances, and the helmsman still stood with the wheel firmly in his hands. Fortunately, the helm was still responding, meaning that they could maintain control of the ship. If that equipment had been damaged, the entire ship could have been lost. The captain quickly regained his senses and began issuing orders to deal with the emergency. It's estimated that the wave that struck the Michelangelo was approximately 21.4 meters or 70 feet tall. The explosive impact collapsed a portion of her forward aluminum bulkhead and a large segment right where her forward passenger cabins were situated was peeled away in an instant. Passengers John Steinbach and Werner Berndt were killed on impact, and a young crew member, Desidero Ferrari, would die from his injuries a few hours later. Another 50 passengers were injured, some severely. But in a major stroke of luck, none of the liner's vital equipment was damaged, including her engines, propellers, or rudder. The worst of the storm was over, allowing her shaken crew to patch the damage as best as they could. On April 15th, they rendezvoused with a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter to airlift a crew member with a fractured skull. The rest of the injured passengers and crew filled the medical rooms, treated by the ship's medical crew. The battered Michelangelo limped into New York Harbor on April 16th with her flag at half-mast. She arrived at Pier 90 to an onslaught of reporters and concerned family members. Temporary repairs were carried out at the Bethlehem Shipyard in Hoboken, and on April 20th, she departed for Genoa, where permanent repairs were made. The aluminum panels used in her superstructure were replaced with stronger steel. Aluminum was a common material in superstructures at the time, and these changes were also made to her sister, as well as the SS United States and the SS France. These improvements held up well when the Michelangelo faced another hurricane force storm in December of 1967. Unsurprisingly, Michelangelo's passenger numbers were disappointing from the moment she entered service, and as the 1960s drew on, her numbers only grew worse. Many of the great ocean liners at the time were either retiring or operating as cruise ships part of the year in a desperate attempt to retain passengers. While the Michelangelo's exteriors might suggest that she would make a great cruise ship, her passenger accommodations were divided into three classes, making the conversion to a single-class cruise configuration difficult and her three lowest passenger decks were constructed without any portholes, meaning a huge number of her cabins had no windows at all, rendering many of them undesirable to vacationing cruise passengers. Because of these shortcomings and her unfortunate timing, the Michelangelo had a relatively short career, and she was withdrawn from service in July 1975. Her final voyage was commanded by now senior captain Claudio Kuslich. Norwegian Cruise Lines briefly considered purchasing the laid-up liner, but ultimately they purchased the SS France instead. In 1976, she was sold to the Shah of Iran and used as a floating barrack. She was finally scrapped in 1991. In a way, the Michelangelo and her sister helped mark the death of the ocean liner. They were notorious financial disasters for the Italian line and never found their footing as the industry moved to cruising. Now her greatest claim to fame might be her encounter with a rogue wave, a terrifying ordeal that demonstrated the deadly forces the great ocean liners overcame even in their waning days. Just after midnight on February 8th, 2000, Captain Keith Avery of the research vessel RRS Discovery found himself fighting through the heaviest seas he had ever encountered. 
The 47 scientists and crew on board had embarked on a routine research voyage. Now, throughout the 3,000 ton ship, they braced themselves wherever they could to keep from being thrown around like rag dolls. They were sailing 175 miles off the coast of Scotland, trapped by a series of storms in an area just east of Rockall, a volcanic island nicknamed Waveland for its notoriously unforgiving seas that have claimed more than 1,000 ships. Just when it seemed the situation couldn't get any worse, the RRS Discovery plunged into a deep trough. The ship rolled 28 degrees to port, then heaved 30 degrees back to starboard, before a massive wall of water came out of nowhere and towered over the ship. Captain Avery helplessly plunged his ship forward, smashing into the roaring mountain of sea. The deafening sounds of the ship crashing through the torrent seemed to stop time itself until somehow they emerged at the other side. Their ship was bruised and battered. A lifeboat on her foredeck was destroyed. Computers and furnishings were smashed to pieces, but the ship managed to survive. For centuries, sailors have told stories of massive walls of water that come out of nowhere and swallow ships in an instant. But these stories were thought to be nothing but legend and hyperbole. The RRS Discovery, however, was different. Being a research vessel, she was equipped with sensors that recorded every wave the ship encountered. After their harrowing voyage, one of the ship's two chief scientists, Dr. Penny Holliday, analyzed the data they had recorded. She found that the significant wave height, an average of the largest 33% of waves, was an astonishing 61 feet or 18.6 meters. And the biggest wave they encountered measured a full 95.5 feet or 29.1 meters. They were some of the largest waves ever scientifically recorded. A rogue wave is defined as a wave that reaches a height more than double the significant wave height at the time. Until the phenomenon was first officially recorded by the Dropner gas platform in the Norwegian North Sea in 1995, it was thought that these massive waves existed only in myth. Tall tales told by storm-addled mariners. But a number of well-known ocean liners had their own encounters with these deadly forces of nature. The RMS Lusitania, one of the largest and fastest ships in the world at the time, had her own encounter in 1910 with a wave that nearly doomed the massive liner. RMS Lusitania was a record-breaking ship built out of mounting anxiety that British merchant shipping was falling behind. In 1897, the German liner Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross captured the Blue Ribbon, the record for the fastest Atlantic crossing from Cunard's Campania, and the prize remained in German hands when the Deutschland claimed the record in 1900. At the same time, the American banking mogul J.P. Morgan, who you may know from that $100 fee on a $2 overdraft, was buying up British shipping companies in an attempt to monopolize transatlantic trade. In 1902, Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company purchased Cunard's biggest rival, the White Star Line, placing its vast fleet under American ownership. This unnerved the British Admiralty, who was concerned that if a war were to break out, their fleet of merchant vessels would be limited and outclassed. With all of that in mind, Cunard approached the British government with a plan for two record-breaking ships that would restore national pride and provide two valuable naval assets if a war was ever to break out. The British government agreed to fund the project with a loan of 2.6 million pounds and an operating subsidy of 75,000 pounds a year with a mail contract that added another 68,000 pounds a year. The Lusitania and Mauritania, both named after Roman provinces, followed strict requirements laid out by the Admiralty that would make it easy to convert the ships into auxiliary cruisers. World War I would quickly show that large ocean liners made for terrible warships, but they didn't realize this at the time. The Lusitania was designed by famed naval architect Leonard Peskett and constructed at the John Brown & Co. shipyards in Clydebank, Scotland. She was laid down on August 17, 1904, and launched on June 7, 1906. Princess Louise was meant to christen the ship, 
but she could not attend. Instead, Lady Mary Inverclyde, the widow of Cunard's former chairman, christened the new liner. While she would be the largest liner ever constructed at the time of her launch, only barely beat out by the Mauritania a few months later, speed was the number one priority in her design. Parsons Steam Turbines, a novel and relatively untested technology, was selected to power the new ships after a series of trials on smaller vessels proved their potential. The raw power of these new power plants produced 76,000 horsepower that drove four propellers to achieve an impressive service speed of 24 knots. She sailed her maiden voyage on September 7, 1907, and claimed the blue ribbon a month later in October of that same year. In order to achieve the maximum possible speed, Lusitania's hull was given a knife's edge bow that was designed to cut through waves rather than ride over them. While this allowed greater speed, it also gave the liner unpredictable stability issues. Both Lusitania and Mauritania were known to unexpectedly drop by the bow, sometimes violently, catching crew and passengers off guard, even in relatively calm seas. Both ships were exceptionally capable but in heavy seas, this bow design created some harrowing situations. With sloping mass and dipping prow, the ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. January crossings are notoriously rough and the winter of 1910 was proving especially challenging as a series of storms moved over the North Atlantic. RMS Lusitania left Queensland, Ireland on the morning of Sunday, January 9th, as part of her routine voyage to New York. From the moment she entered the Irish Channel, she was rocked by heavy seas, and as she cleared the Irish coast, she encountered a fierce west by southwest gale that plagued her throughout the voyage. William Thomas Turner joined the Cunard Line as a fourth officer in 1878. He assumed command of his first ship, the Aleppo, in 1903, and in November 1908, Captain Turner was placed in charge of the Lusitania. By late afternoon, Monday, January 10th, Lusitania was facing strong winds out of the west and large swells, but she was making steady progress at a reduced speed of 14 knots. At 6 p.m., Captain Turner left the bridge to attend dinner with the few passengers who weren't overcome with seasickness. Chief Officer Sandy G.S. McNeil was placed in charge while the captain was away. McNeil was recruited as an officer for the Cunard Line when he was 26 years old. He began his service on the Pavonia and worked his way up through the ranks until he was promoted to Chief Officer of the Umbria in 1905. He was transferred to the Lusitania in 1907. Conditions that day were rough, but nothing too challenging for the great liner. McNeil stood at the bridge railing and watched the storm as they plowed forward. Without warning, the ship dropped from beneath him, violently falling into a particularly deep trough. Briefly stunned, McNeil looked for the horizon, but to his horror, all he saw was a massive wall of green water rushing toward them. He sprinted for the wheelhouse, but before he could even shut the door behind him, the massive waves slammed into the ship. The onslaught plunged the bridge into chaos as water overtook McNeil, rising up to his chest. The wheel, still firmly gripped in Quartermaster Ripley's hands, was ripped from the helm as the man was thrown up against the wall that separated the wheelhouse from the chart room. Quartermaster Harding, who was standing nearby, was also swept across the room and suffered a mild leg injury. The water short-circuited the side lights, as well as the lights in the foremast, chart room, and wheelhouse, plunging everything into darkness. In the confusion, McNeil struggled to his feet as the now waist-deep water filled with wood splinters swirled all around him. All he remembered seeing was a white-gloved hand whisk past him in the chaos. The hand belonged to a deckhand named Tommy Hughes, who threw himself to the floor as the wall of water slammed into the bridge. He was picked up and swept across the room, only narrowly grabbing hold of an iron stanchion just in time to keep him from washing overboard. Above the bridge, Third Officer Story was on the compass platform. He saw the wave coming and clung to the compass stand for dear life as the water smashed over him. As the seawater drained away, 
McNeil finally came to his senses, and 15 minutes later, they were able to switch back on the lights. That's when they realized the full extent of the damage. The force of the wave smashed in most of the windows of the wheelhouse, dented the steel wall, and splintered much of the woodwork. Water rushed through the officer's wardroom and flooded much of the officer's quarters. The forward two starboard lifeboats had been lifted from their davits and smashed into the deck. Their 10-inch iron davits had been twisted by the sheer force of the water. McNeil then realized that his coat and shirt were covered with blood. Sometime in the chaos, he sustained a cut across his head and another on his chin. Miraculously, McNeil's cuts and Quartermaster Harding's leg were the only two injuries reported. Both were mild. Several passengers were startled by the impact, but probably because most of them were in their berths battling seasickness, no one else was seriously injured. Lusitania's bow was unscathed, aside from some damage to the decking on her forecastle. Bulkheads in the forward steward's quarters were slightly warped, and the copper pipes that connected the stern hoisting gear forward were bent. The ship was stopped while the damage was surveyed and quickly patched. Canvas was secured over the bridge windows. Her aft steering gear was used until her wheel could be reattached, and 40 minutes after the wave strike, they were back underway. The incident left permanent depressions in her deck and bridge that remained with the ship for the rest of her career. The Lusitania arrived in New York several hours behind schedule. She was quickly repaired and returned to normal service. It's unknown exactly how large of a wave hit the liner that day, but Captain Turner noted that the top of her wheelhouse was 80 feet or 24.4 meters above the waterline, and the wave easily washed well over it. He remarked to the press that it was the most memorable incident of his career, but other events would easily claim that distinction for him a few years later. Chief Officer McNeil was soon promoted to staff captain and transferred to the Mauritania the following year. He was the first Cunard officer to hold that title. He later would serve as captain of the Mauritania. Captain Turner remained with the Lusitania until transferring to another liner in 1912. He was reunited with Lucy in 1915, taking command of the liner as she continued operating passenger voyages despite the outbreak of World War I. On May 7, 1915, he would survive her sinking, an event that would have a profound impact on history. But that's a story for another day. The Lusitania was one of few legendary ships to face the onslaught of a rogue wave. Her size and sturdiness helped her emerge with only superficial damage. But the encounter is a reminder that no matter how large and powerful we build our ships, the sea will always be larger. Just after midnight on December 12, 1978, Heinz Lohmann, the radio operator on a German cruise ship, the MS Caribe, was chatting with a friend, Jörg Ernst, the radio operator on the cargo ship MS München, sailing about 2,400 nautical miles away. Their conversation was casual, and they used a frequency designated for unofficial communications. The connection was hampered by atmospheric interference, and Lohman could barely hear Ernst as he told him that the Munchen was fighting through a massive storm on the North Atlantic. The heavy seas already smashed in some portholes and did some minor damage to her bridge, but Ernst was unconcerned. The Munchen was a modern vessel designed to handle the worst that the North Atlantic could throw at it. She was considered practically unsinkable. After a minute or two, Ernst's transmissions became nearly inaudible. Lohman asked if he wanted to try another frequency, but he declined, and they decided to end their transmission. Ernst signed off by telling his friend, have a good trip and see you soon. Three hours later, at 3.10 a.m., the Greek freighter Marion picked up a faint SOS signal sent using Morse code. The message was almost indecipherable, but they were able to make out the Munchen's call sign, a position that would later prove to be incorrect, in the words 50 degrees starboard. Not long after, signals were received from the Munchen's automatic emergency beacons, 
And soon, a massive international search and rescue operation was launched. But the Munchen and her crew were never seen again. Only traces of the massive cargo ship were ever found, leaving only a few clues that hinted at a horrifying end. On September 1st, 1970, the two legacy German shipping companies, Hamburg American Line, or Hopog, and Norddeutscher Lloyd, merged to create Hopog Lloyd. Today, it is the fifth largest container shipping company in the world. On May 12, 1972, as they expanded and modernized their fleet, the company launched a new vessel labeled Hole Number 860 at the Cockerell Shipyards in Belgium. Christened the MS München, the German name for the city of Munich, the new vessel was unique in that she was the only German flagged Lash carrier. A Lash, or lighter aboard ship, was a design developed in the 1960s by the American engineer Jerome Goldman. Similar to container ships, these vessels were designed to carry a number of small barges called lighters. They typically came equipped with a large crane that can lower individual lighters into the water, where they can be towed by a tug up smaller waterways. This made it faster and easier to unload and distribute cargo. The Munchen was 857.5 feet or 261.4 meters in length, with a beam of 105.5 feet or 32.2 meters, and came in at 37,134 gross registered tons. She was powered by a 9-cylinder Solzer 9 R&D 90 diesel engine that generated 26,100 horsepower, driving a single 5-bladed propeller to achieve an 18-knot service speed. She was well equipped and designed to power through even hurricane force weather conditions. MS München was delivered to Hopog Lloyd on December 22, 1972, and she sailed her maiden voyage a month later on October 19th. She had an identical sister, the MS Bilderdijk, which was built for the Holland America line and sailed until she was retired at the end of 2007 and scrapped. In their early years, both ships proved capable and their crews had little reason to worry, even when navigating through harsh conditions, which they frequently sailed through as they delivered cargo throughout the year. The Munchen departed Bremerhaven for her 62nd voyage on December 7, 1978. She was bound for her typical destination in Savannah, Georgia, and her route would take her through a powerful storm that had been ravaging over the North Atlantic since November. But these were the types of conditions the Munchen was designed to handle, and she had already weathered similar storms during her career. There was no reason to believe this would be anything other than a rough but overall routine voyage. She was commanded by Captain Johann Danekamp and had 28 people on board, including 25 men and three women. Her cargo consisted of 83 lighters that contained mostly steel products, as well as a replacement nuclear reactor vessel head for a company called Combustion Engineering Incorporated. The voyage began just like any other, but as the Munchen continued to the North Atlantic, conditions rapidly deteriorated as they approached the outer edges of the storm. And by the evening of December 11th, just north of the Azores, they found themselves sailing through the heart of the gale. A nearby British weather station called the storm the Monster of the Month. Wind speeds reached 93 miles or 150 kilometers per hour, and waves easily reached nearly 50 feet or 15 meters high. Still, the crew of the Munchen indicated no concern. As radio operator Jörg Ernst conversed with his friend Heinz Lohmann on the German cruise ship Karibe, 2,400 nautical miles away, just after midnight on December 12th, he casually noted that the ship was fighting through a rough storm and had taken some damage to the bridge and some portholes, but he seemed largely unfazed. This was not the first time the seasoned radio men experienced a winter storm on the North Atlantic. Ernst continued to describe their situation, but Lohman could not understand the rest of the message. He asked Ernst if he wanted to try and find a stronger frequency, but Ernst declined. He signed off by telling his friend, have a good trip 
and see you soon. The night continued and the storm raged on. At around 3.10 a.m., the radio operator on the Greek freighter Marion picked up a chilling signal. Badly distorted by atmospheric interference, he could just barely decipher a weak SOS message sent in Morse code. Soon, a Soviet vessel, the Maria Yermolova, also began picking up these distress calls. Over a series of messages, the Marion was able to make out the word forward, as well as the ship's name and position. Another ship picked up the words 50 degrees starboard and the word Articus. These fragmented messages presented a puzzle that continues to baffle investigators, and we'll explore their possible meanings later in this video. Radio operators all over the North Atlantic continued to receive fragmented messages from the Munchen, broadcast using emergency equipment, suggesting the Munchen had lost power. At 4.43 a.m., Multiple radio stations began receiving automatic emergency signals from the ship. This continued until 7.34, when U.S. stations changed to another frequency, but it's thought that these messages continued to transmit for hours. Initially, despite the concerning calls for help, there was very little alarm. The Munchen was well known to be a capable vessel, and while it was clear that she had run into trouble in the storm, few thought that the situation was as dire as it would soon prove to be. But by mid-morning, as the weak messages continued and the storm raged on, an international search and rescue effort was soon organized. Within hours, it would balloon into a massive search effort that would uncover a series of clues that hinted to a horrifying end for the Munchen and her crew. For centuries, sailors have told stories about massive walls of water that come out of nowhere and swallow ships in an instant. But by 1978, the field of oceanography had yet to recognize this phenomenon. As ships became larger and more resilient, encounters with freak waves became more survivable, and in the 20th century, a handful of notable ships began returning to port with horrifying stories to share. In January of 1910, a massive wave smashed into the RMS Lusitania, permanently damaging her bridge. In December 1942, while carrying over 11,000 U.S. troops, the RMS Queen Mary was hit broadside by a 92-foot or 28-meter wave. After listing a terrifying 52 degrees to port, she slowly righted herself. The incident inspired the 1969 novel in subsequent 1972 film, The Poseidon Adventure. And in 1966, one of these massive walls of water smashed into the Italian luxury liner Michelangelo, ripping into her superstructure and killing three on board. But without any official recordings or studies, these occurrences were poorly understood. For a number of years, researchers used a mathematical formula called the Gaussian function to predict wave height. This formula showed that waves over 98 feet, or 30 meters, were only possible once every 10,000 years. While researchers suspected that this phenomenon was more common, it wasn't until January 1st, 1995, when a wave that reached 84 feet, or 25.6 meters, was recorded by sensors on the Dropner gas platform in the North Sea. This event set off research into the rogue wave phenomenon that continues to this day. A rogue wave is defined as a wave that reaches more than twice the significant wave height in the area at the time. While still rare, oceanographers now know that these massive waves happen several times a year all over the world. We're only just beginning to understand rogue waves, but it's believed that there is no one cause that triggers these events. Rather, they are created by a series of factors that converge when conditions are just right. It's thought that high winds and currents can create an unusual sea state, 
where a normal wave begins to draw in energy from the waves around it, generating one massive wave for a brief period of time. Areas with strong currents that run counter to wave direction seem to create these conditions more often. Cape Agolis in South Africa has been identified as a prime example of one of these locations. Though researchers are beginning to understand rogue waves, we're still a long way from accurately predicting this deadly phenomenon. But we know much more than we did when the Munchen sailed into that brutal North Atlantic storm in 1978. While the Munchen's SOS messages were picked up as early as 3.10 a.m. on December 12th, Hopog Lloyd didn't receive word of the unfolding crisis until 6 a.m. An international search and rescue operation, coordinated by His Majesty's Coast Guard at Land's End in Cornwall, began organizing at 7.30, and the first Royal Air Force reconnaissance aircraft, a Hawker Sidley Nimrod, took off at 9.30 to begin the search. These initial efforts were slowed by the ongoing intensity of the storm. Winds continued to exceed hurricane force as searchers began arriving in the general area reported by the Munchen's distress calls. At 3.30 p.m., the Coast Guard appointed the Dutch salvage tug Smit Rotterdam, commanded by Captain P.F. De Nijs, as the on-scene search and rescue coordinator. By the next day, December 13th, three planes and six ships searched for the Munchen. At 9.06 that morning, Michael F. Sinnott, an amateur radio enthusiast in Brussels, picked up a voice transmission on a strange radio frequency typically used by a German radio station. The transmission was clear, but background noise made it difficult to make out the full message. But Sinnott was able to hear the Munchen's name and call sign. He only had a receiver for that particular frequency, so he was unable to communicate with the message's sender. He relayed the message to officials, and later he told investigators that the voice he heard was calm and spoke in English with a heavy German accent. Later that afternoon, between 5 and 7.14 p.m., the U.S. Naval Station in Rota, Spain, picked up 10 weak Mayday calls sent using Morse code. These messages mentioned 28 persons on board and the Munchen's call sign. They were likely recorded and played on a loop. As the day went on, the search continued. Wind speeds remained high, and visibility was limited to just two to four nautical miles. The next day, December 14th, the German Navy joined the search efforts, adding additional planes and vessels. Winds decreased slightly, but still presented a challenge. By now, all radio messages from the Munchen had stopped, but signals were still heard from her emergency buoy. Finally, at 7 p.m., the British freighter King George found the first traces of the missing ship, a single unused life raft. Soon the Hopog Lloyd freighter Erlangen found three of the Munchen's lighters. Over the following days, as wind speeds eased, the search grew. On December 15th, a British Nimrod aircraft spotted two of the ship's orange buoys, and a salvage tug called the Titan picked up another life raft. This one was covered in oil, with no signs that it had ever been used by any of the Munchen's crew. On December 16th, a third unused life raft was found by the MS Badenstein. By December 17th, the weather had calmed considerably, making search efforts easier. Ships combed the area spaced three nautical miles apart, covering a massive expanse. Soon, a fourth life raft was found by the Sealand consumer. Three life vests were also sighted. And that afternoon, the Dusseldorf Express discovered the Munchen's emergency radio buoy smeared with oil. Over the next few days, the search continued to grow, but hope that anyone from the ill-fated cargo ship could be found alive was fading. Days passed without any additional discoveries, and on December 20th, the international search effort was called off. The German government and Hopog Lloyd decided to continue leading search efforts for another two days, but this also proved unsuccessful. At sundown on December 22nd, the last efforts to find any of the Munchen surviving crew members were called off. Over 80 merchant and naval vessels from a number of countries and 13 aircraft from the United Kingdom, United States, 
Portugal and Germany all took part in the massive search effort. The last critical trace of the Munchen was found on February 16, 1979, when the car transporter Don Carlos discovered and salvaged her starboard side lifeboat. No other trace of the Munchen has ever been found. An official investigation into the loss of the Munchen was conducted by the Maritime Authority in Bremerhaven. They released an official report on the incident in June 1980. In it, they found no evidence of any defect in the design, furnishings, equipment, condition, loading, or manning of the ship that could have caused her sinking. Investigators zeroed in on the lone starboard lifeboat. They found that the large vertical pins that once held the lifeboat in place were bent back from forward to aft, indicating that a massive force struck the forward starboard side of the ship, forcing the lifeboat back and tearing it from its pins. The lifeboat's position on the ship's superstructure was usually 66 feet or 20 meters above the waterline. Investigators concluded that the severe weather the Munchen encountered created an unusual event that led to her sinking. This was before rogue waves were understood or even widely thought to exist, so the vocabulary used in the report was left vague. Officially, the exact fate of the Munchen remains unsolved. But taken altogether, the investigation and radio messages received over the course of the event paint a compelling picture of what likely happened to the Munchen on that fateful night. Dozens of radio messages were received by numerous operators both on shore and on various vessels in the area. Most of these messages were nearly unintelligible, but a handful of words and phrases were deciphered, including the ship's name and position, as well as the words forward, 50 degrees starboard, Articus and collision. The words forward and collision probably refer to the event that caused the ship's distress. 50 degrees starboard could likely refer to a list, but it's been pointed out that these words could also refer to an overtaking angle or a localization. The word Articus has sparked a great deal of speculation. The investigation figured that this was a recording error and the word was supposed to be antennas which would make sense in describing the damage. But others have suggested that this could have referred to a Russian ship in the area named the Artemida, which was likely the closest ship to the Munchen at the time of the message. Unfortunately, the position given in these transmissions proved to be at least 100 nautical miles off from the Munchen's actual location at the time. This critical mistake slowed search efforts in those critical early hours. The transmission picked up by Michael F. Sennett on December 13th is by far the strangest. The frequency, typically used by a German radio station, was one that the Munchen's emergency power would not have been strong enough to broadcast on. If this message was authentic, it would suggest that the Munchen was briefly able to restore power long enough to transmit. But why they would choose that frequency is a mystery. Hoppa Lloyd officials believed that the messages were authentic. While strange, they would support the widely held theory of what happened to the Munchen. Taken altogether, with a modern understanding of rogue waves, it's now commonly believed that on the night of December 12th, while the Munchen was fighting through the storm, she suddenly fell into a deep trough. Before she could recover, a massive wall of water, likely 100 feet or 30 meters high, smashed into the ship. The force of the water did major damage to her superstructure, ripping the lifeboat from its pinnings, caving in windows, and likely destroying critical equipment. The crippled ship, now powerless and unable to steer, was left to the mercy of the storm, where she was battered by waves until she eventually flooded and perhaps even capsized. Based on the length of time that emergency messages were transmitted, it's believed that the Munchen remained floating for up to 33 hours. She likely drifted with a heavy list, making it almost impossible to move around, trapping her crew all over the doomed ship until she finally disappeared beneath the waves. It's a chilling end to a ship that was once thought to be practically unsinkable. As of the making of this video, the wreck of the Munchen 
has never been found. But her story serves as a reminder of the incredible bravery shown by merchant mariners, including those who sail today. Though shipping is considerably safer thanks to lessons learned from tragedies like the Munchen, sailors still sacrifice and endure the terrifying might of the seas, all to keep our world moving forward.